The concept I'm presenting today has been something that's been on my mind for a couple weeks, and I'm going to try to present it in a way that's clear and understandable so you can get excited about the idea as I am excited about the idea because it's kind of neat, but I hadn't had a good way to explain it, so I'm trying to just rip off the band-aid, so let's get into it. Hey fellow Game Masters, I'm Richard Quiner, and welcome back to the Daily D20, your daily dose of all things tabletop role-playing games, helping you build your world and master your game. Now today, the topic I want to talk about is kind of going to cover both those. It'll help you build your world and master your game a little bit. And I will disclaimer this, this concept works for me pretty well. I feel comfortable with it, but it might not be for everyone. So keep that in mind. It's not a catch-all situation or problem solver that I'm presenting. One thing I've noticed constantly and for myself and new DMs, one of their biggest questions is when do they stop preparing? When do they have enough material to prepare? And when do they, you know, have they put in enough details? They're always worried about the details. And it's really easy to get in this mindset of you need the details, the details, the details. Because as consumers of media and art and pop culture and things, we have it driven home all the time. Like, look at the detail that these artists have put into their work. Look at the detail in this story. If we look at, you know, Game of Thrones or the Lord of the Rings books or any of those, we see the detail and the depth that was put into it. And so we, as cre other creative types, all of us GMs and other creator writers and such, we look at that and we say, oh, I have to have that too. We need to have that detail. It's expected for art to have that level of detail. And so we try to begin doing that, and then we find we don't have the time to put in all the detail in our session prep. And that's what I'm getting at. For preparing for your sessions, we don't have the time to put in every single detail. We don't have the time to say what color the forks are in the tavern on the certain town that we're working on. And I think as new DMs, it's easy to get discouraged to think, oh, I haven't done the work. I haven't put in the detail that my story needs. And so because we haven't put in the detail that we think we need, it gets us kind of discouraged. And the only thing worse than not having the detail in the story is not telling the story itself. Now that I've rambled on about that, having experienced that myself, the idea I came up with is the concept that when you're preparing a session, start very broad with rules and work your way down to the details as time permits. Because if you don't get to the certain details, you have to be okay with it. You just have to move on. But by starting broad, I'm going to show you how looking at the big picture, kind of the rules of your world and your country can help you at the table improvise and run your game and come up with those details on the fly and as you work your way down from the broad topics down to the more detailed topics or the detailed things of your story you know if you run out of time you're still pretty safe so it's a pretty safe method that i've been using in detailing my things in my in my world building i would say not really in my adventures so much but in the world building that i've been creating starting broad and working my way down has been very helpful so let's go over some samples of this or examples. I always say start with your world. Start with the big picture. If you're playing in a Dungeons & Dragons world, one of the ones that Wizards of the Coast has created and set all their game stories in, you have a lot of material already there. But I would say even then, you don't need to go read all the novels and find all the details of the world that they built. You just need to figure out the basic idea. Some of the basic ideas of Dungeons & Dragons the world that they've created is everyone speaks common. Common is a is the main language of the world. You also have that there's always elves, humans, dwarves, halflings. You know, they establish the base common races of their world. There's magic. Magic is in their world. There's also creatures and things that try to kill you. There's a lot of danger. There's a lot of different climates that you can encounter. These are the rules of the world that they've made for Dungeons and Dragons. And if I were to name a couple cities, you probably have heard of some of these cities. Baldur's Gate, Neverwinter, Waterdeep. These have been in the news lately with the different adventures that have been coming out for Dungeons & Dragons. These are things that they've set as the big picture rules. So you as a game master, if you run a game in Dungeons & Dragons and you need to name a big town, you already know that there's these three towns already named and you can just throw one in there and that works. And it's a detail that it's just part of the rules of the world. So when you're building your own world, what are some of the rules that you need to determine for your own world? I like to look at them and like, what are the, what is the main language of your world? Does it have one main language? Like 
Dungeons and Dragons Forgotten Realms? Does everyone speak common? Do you have other languages that are more prevalent in your world? Or are each country even speaking their own main language? How does this work in your world? You could even get into the scientific side of things and like gravity. What is the gravity like in your world? This is what I've been thinking about because when talking to DMs and there's a player and the player says, oh, I want to jump this gap that's 100 feet wide. And the players say, oh, or the DMs might say, no, that's too far. You can't jump it. But then I thought about it and I was like, but what if I create a world where the gravity is such that players can actually do that? It's like, if you ever see the terrible John Carter movie, he jumps extreme distances because the gravity is different and his muscle composition is different. So what if that is something that can happen in your world. It's up to you. It's your world. It's your rules. In the real world, here on Earth, the dominant species in the world is human. We are controlling everything. Do we have one main language? No, everyone kind of speaks their own language. We have a lot of different languages, but we do have some that are a little more dominant than others. We have our gravity works a certain way. Our calendar works a certain way in all parts of the world. So we have some rules of our world. That's what I'm trying to point out. You have the big picture rules, and that's what you want to come up with is some big picture rules first. Because when you're playing the game, then that will inform some decisions that you might have to make on the fly. Then we get to countries. Countries, if your world has countries, that's another world rule you might have to decide. Countries have their own rules too. The US is very different than France, it's very different than Spain, or China, or any other country in the world. The US, we have our own rules. Our dominant language is English. We're a bunch of humans here, like we're still all dominant human species. We don't have elves and dwarves on Earth, which that'd be cool, but we don't. But that's something you can ask about your country. What is the predominant race in your country? What languages did the people in your country speak? What kind of government does it have? Does it have a country government or is it more based on cities and towns? How does your country work? You come up with those kind of questions, you answer those questions and come up with those rules for your country and then you you go from there. So you, it's like kind of like a, a pyramid almost where you start very broad, you have the world, world rules, then you have the country rules, then we go down to the city rules where each city could be a little different. It's like Los Angeles and New York are two very different cities, even though we're in the same country. Los Angeles is, is a big city. It's really spread out everyone drives it's a car city you need to have a car really to get around easily here there is public transportation but it's not as good i'm just gonna say that it's not as good but it is also the center of entertainment television and movies and music and all things here if you go to new york it's more of a pedestrian town people take the subways public transportation people walk everywhere they also are more of a center of finance and banking and communication so it's a very different culture even though we're in the same country. And we of course have our own different governments that kind of run the cities. So that's what I mean by what are your city rules? Do you have a city that's all dwarves? Do you have a city that's all drow maybe? A city of elves? These sort of things. Are all your cities one big melting pot of people? Some other things you can think about for your cities is what is the climate of your city? What are the actual weather? What's the weather like? What about factions? Do you have some factions in your city? Are these factions warring against each other? Do you have a big disparity between upper and lower class. What does the financial situation look in your city? And if you answer these big picture questions when you're sitting at the table and you introduce your players to your city and they want to see something, you know the rules of your city already so it becomes much easier for you to make something up on the fly. I say it makes it easier. I'm not saying it makes it easy. It's easier than it previously was. It still takes practice. It still takes work and effort to be able to improvise on the fly like that, but it makes it considerably easier when you know the rules of your city. And I also wanted to mention the last, and you can see how this can go on in detail and detail all the way down the line. I wanted to mention also dungeons though can also have rules. The adventures can have a ruling such as is what is your dungeon's main theme? That's kind of a rule of your dungeon. And if you say, oh, it's run by a necromancer, suddenly right there, you know that there's zombies and skeletons in your dungeon. So if you need to kind of come up with something on the fly, because maybe your characters or maybe your players aren't finding a fight and they're getting bored and they want to fight. So you need to put a fight in front of them. 
you know it's going to be skeletons or zombies because it's a necromancer. Now, how does this help make the world a little more interesting? You, I'm saying, I'm sitting here, I'm saying build rules into your world, but rules is not the fun part of life. The fun part of life is the variety and the interest thing, things and the, the details, right? So once you have the rules for your dungeon and city and country and world, it makes it easier, first off, like I said, it makes it easier for you to improvise and add NPCs or different things into your world right off the bat. But what if you want to make something stand out as very interesting? You just change the rule. You break the rule to make something interesting. So if you've made a rule that you're in a city that is drow, for example. The drow, we know, they live underground. They're usually very evil, unless a player has them. But you have a rule about drow. But then you want a character to stand out in drow society underground? What's weirder than having an elf in the middle of drow? Elf and drow are sworn enemies. So if you suddenly had a drow city with an elf character in there, that's interesting. That says this character is special. Maybe the player should pay more attention to that. Give it some attention. In my world building, I have a whole country that's run by dwarves. I kind of made it a melting pot. And that, looking back, I'm like, oh, this would have been, I think it would have been more interesting had I just said it's a bunch of dwarves, had I not made it a melting pot. But in my defense, it was our player's starting area. They come from a lot of different places, so I kind of eased them in. We'll see later, they might go to another city or another country or another town somewhere where common might not be helpful to them. They might go to a country that's all dragonborn and they all speak draconic and no one speaks common in that town. How crazy would that be? Because then the players suddenly are there and they only have one person that can translate for them. It makes it interesting. It gives it a little bit of life. If you've ever traveled to a country where you don't speak the language, it's an interesting, memorable experience, and I think something that players could enjoy. So as I'm here rambling and I'm talking about building the rules and then breaking your rules that you've established for your world, I'm also coming up with ideas for mine. So my players, I hope they don't watch this far into the video. Maybe they will. I hope I surprise them at least when I get there. Anyways, that is my concept of start with the big picture, build the rules of your world, then work down to the details, and then break the rules to make things interesting and make things stand out for your players. If you want to see more world building videos, go ahead and click this video over here. If you want to see other videos possibly about spellcasting classes or magic, click the video over here. And of course, I've been Richard. Thanks for watching.